Mm-hmm. Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Stop Playing Podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know that I'm bringing you the information and the conversations Mm -hmm. to help you make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. And you are in for a treat on today's show because we have a whole lineup, okay? A couch full of beautiful (laughs) black women who are here to talk about a very important conversation, okay? I like to be silly. We like to have fun here on Girls Stop Playing, but today is going to be more of a serious conversation because Mm -hmm. it's literally a matter of life and death Mm -hmm. at this point. Um, I believe we were experiencing several pandemics before the pandemic. This Mm -hmm. is just, you know, has been the most popular one, but the black community has been under attack for generations. Um, And so I think that it's so important that we stop only talking about the problems, but start sharing some solutions. And so we got some solutions in the building. (laughs) All right. So we're going to start on the end. Solution number one, what's your name? Introduce yes. yourself. We're going to get in your business a little bit, too. I ain't tell y'all that part. That's but, all right. Um, so <laughs> introduce yourself, your name, your title, um, or what it is that you do, and your relationship status. Absolutely. So I am Dr. Maya McCarthy. I am a board-certified pediatrician, but I am also a concierge fertility strategist and coach. Love okay. It. And so um, my my status is I am married. Yes, married. Okay. So I'm Andrea Blanton. I am a doula uh, for pregnancy and birth, getting into postpartum care, and I am currently in a relationship with my child's father. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, my name is Michaela Walker, and I am an advocate for postpartum uh, mental illnesses and physical illnesses, and I also advocate for maternal mortality, Mm -hmm. and I am in a relationship. (laughs) So, guys, as you can see, um, the topic of conversation today is Black women's womb wellness. Um, I have had several conversations with sisters sitting right on this couch Mm -hmm. who have talked about everything from fibroids several times Mm -hmm. um, to other infertility issues. Mm -hmm. Um, We had one young lady who, at I think the age of 30, discovered she was going through perimenopause. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm just like, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. For me, personally, to sit here and continue to consume these stories, Mm -hmm. share these stories, but then not also sit here and try to share some solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're here for today. Um, And so I want to just start with a very general question around some of the most common issues. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Maya. Some of the most common issues that Black women specifically are facing when it comes to our womb wellness? So far and away, you know, we are disproportionately affected by fibroids, endometriosis, PCOS, um, the list goes on and on. And it all contributes to infertility in the African-American community. And just as you say, It's not something that we talk about, but it's something we need to. Mm -hmm. Like, nobody's having this conversation around Thanksgiving dinner. Right. But we need to. Yes. Mm -hmm. To that point, one of the young ladies who sat here and talked about her fibroids, she didn't realize that fibroids ran in her family Mm -hmm. until she was diagnosed with fibroids and started asking questions. And then her mom and her aunts and everybody's Mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, Mm -hmm. this is just kind of, you're a black woman. This is what, this is. The cards that you're dealt basically as a black woman, which, first of all, that's not true. Okay, you I don't think that should be an expectation. I'm a black woman. I'm going to develop fibroids one day. But also, where is the conversation? Where's the preventative conversation or even just the awareness of this? These are the things that are um, prominent in our family. Let's talk about what we can start doing to, you know, end end it with us. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what are you all, I guess, seeing mostly with the with the women that you're working with that they're experiencing? Um, So I work with women who are expecting children Mm -hmm. and women who have had children. And I focus um, on their mental health and their Mm -hmm. physical health. So a little backstory about myself. Um, I almost lost my life giving birth Mm -hmm. in 2020. Um, I had -hmm. a great pregnancy. I didn't even know you can have complications after you give birth, but that's a thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
ever since then, my 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 bout with um, postpartum, I've just been going around and you know advocating for women, especially Black women, mm -hmm. because they are we are dying at an alarming mm -hmm. rate mm -hmm. more than the the white woman, and so I feel like through advocacy and you know people knowing what to look for um, when they're having a baby while they're pregnant and afterwards too, um, mm -hmm. we can um, improve the mortality rate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I want to um, bring back up something that you mentioned in terms of the fact that you had like a perfect pregnancy. That is the, a common story of so many women who have just no hiccups, nothing abnormal. And then that baby comes out and things just go haywire. What do you mind sharing what you um what you dealt with after your birth? So yes, um like I said I had an uneventful pregnancy, but after I gave birth my doctor noticed that my blood pressure was going up mm -hmm. and I never had blood pressure issues, never. Mm -hmm. Never. And so they made me stay a week after giving birth. Even though my baby was able to go home, I had to stay. Um they released me um, a week later, and I was home for two days, and my blood pressure went mm. to 246 oh my goodness. over 130. And so I called my doctor. I was like, um, do you think I should take a nap? Will it go down? She was like, um, no, I think I should meet you at the hospital. hospital. Mm. Um, and they gave me a lot of preventive medicines to try to bring my uh, blood pressure down. It wasn't working. So I ended up in the ICU. Mm. Um, and that was an experience. I was very afraid. I'm like, I just had a baby. Mm -hmm. Am I going to you know, be here to raise my son that I just gave birth to. But by the grace of God and my doctors, um, I had an amazing team of doctors. Let me say that. Mm -hmm. They listened to me and they cared for me and advocated for me. Um, and I'm still here. Um, mm -hmm. Amen. So yeah. I had to go home on blood pressure medicines and I had to change my diet. But also when I got home, I started having postpartum anxiety and depression mm -hmm. very scared from my stay in the ICU and so now um I'm an advocate but I can relate to to women who have had complications physical and mental complications yeah. mm -hmm. your story is almost identical to my story mm -hmm. um and another guest that I had on the podcast like almost identical to I ha I got to go home um and then I had to come right back go back wow. right back to the hospital mm -hmm. wow. and being away from your newborn Mm. I mean, there's, there's, there is no feeling. It's almost like being in prison because you can't leave. Right. You know, like you're almost being held against your will. And it's like, right. I've just delivered a child. You know, you during your pregnancy, you hear all about the skin to skin and all of the things yeah. that are so important. Yes. And now I can't be with my child. Mm -hmm. That will lead you into depression. If you weren't already, yes. if you weren't already, um, there's just so much that women have to deal with. And when you have never heard of anybody else dealing with these things and you find yourself in a situation, you think it's only you. Yeah. Um, and that can be lonely. That can be yes. depressing. Oh, that can you know, yes. lead to a host of other issues as well. And so, Dr. Maya, I know you're not um, an OB, but is this, I mean, because two out of four women and I don't you know, listen, know your stories. Listen, yes, yes. I'm about to say three mm. out of four women oh, wow. because my, my birthing experience was somewhat similar now. It was different in that I conceived via IVF. And so that's another topic that, as African-American women, we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. That is as true. a community, we don't talk about. It's looked upon as being taboo. I know when I realized that was going to be the way that I had to conceive, you know, my family was like, you doing what now? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was a whole education process with my family, talking to them about the steps and what was involved and everything. Um, and not to mention the cost. It was very expensive. But uh, IVF con conception or pregnancy already has its risks. Right. So I was already advanced maternal age. Mm -hmm. I conceived via IVF. Um, and so I had to see my OB and my perinatologist almost every other week. I was flip-flopping. I went into the pregnancy 80 pounds heavier than I am now mm. and with chronic hypertension. And so I knew that hypertension was going to be an issue. And I, sure enough, developed preeclampsia mm. and HELP syndrome, which is an, another complication, yeah. at 25 weeks. Wow. wow. That's early. It yeah. is early, yes. And I went in the hot. I went to my doctor's office thinking I'm good. And she's like, you know your blood pressure's up. I was like... 
girl, tell me something else new. We know my blood pressure up. She's like, no, but it's up for real this time. You need to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a 24-hour stay. We're going to let you go home. Everything will be fine. I checked in that Friday. By that Sunday, my liver enzymes had quadrupled. Mm -hmm. My liver was swelling. Mm -hmm. And they told me we have to deliver right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm now facing delivery of a 25-weeker. I knew the consequences of that Mm -hmm. because I'm a pediatrician. I knew too much about it, and it scared me right at the beginning of the pandemic. So I went on bed rest March 4th. World shut down, what, March 13th? I delivered May 17th. Wow. And didn't know if my husband could be there with me. I, too, stayed in the hospital a week after I delivered. I could not see my baby until her third day of life because Mm -hmm. I was on medications to keep Mm -hmm. me safe, keep me Mm -hmm. from developing seizures. Um, The skin to skin, we didn't do. And um, every she we spent 81 days back and forth to Northside Hospital wow. summer of 2020. Wow. Well, I, I gave never, birth in 2020. Did you? I did. Yeah. I never imagined that that would have been my story. Mm-hmm. Never would have imagined it. But just like you, I am an advocate out here letting people know I had a great team of doctors. I chose them for a reason. Yes. I had to go into the hospital making sure my husband knew exactly what to do and what to say just in case something happened to me. And I shouldn't have to do that, that in part. this in the United States of yeah. America in 2020, 2023. I shouldn't have to do it. You yeah. shouldn't. But I had to because I knew that had I not, something would have happened to me. Mm-hmm. The stack of paperwork that I... So I attempted a home birth okay. um, in 2021. Did not work out. Uh, and my midwife ended up sending me to the to the hospital, but I had this stack of paperwork. Y'all know the the birth rights mm-hmm. documentation, the the crazy lady paperwork that you bring. <laughs> if y'all bring in that stack of paperwork to the hospital, you are gonna be the crazy <laughs> the crazy lady room, no. and I'll be the crazy girl. Yes, I will be the crazy lady room, <laughs> but I'm gonna be the lady who's go- going to advocate for, for herself. herself. Yes, I'm yes. going to be the lady who's going to tell you what we're going to do, and you're not going to dictate to me unless it truly is life or death. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think so many women don't know mm-hmm. what to say, don't know mm-hmm. what they can say, feel like they are not allowed mm-hmm. to say, feel like mm-hmm. they don't have a say. And on my second say, when I went back, because I, I'm like a real rebel and I felt fine. That's the thing about blood pressure too. Yes. I felt They're fine, fine. Yes. right? And so I'm like, you know, is this really serious? I want to go home to my baby. I just had a baby. And they're what I said, well, what are y'all going to do if I leave? And they basically said that if I would have left against their will, that I would have been responsible. Insurance wouldn't cover any of my Mm -hmm. bills, basically. And so it truly is, you almost are imprisoned. You can't Mm -hmm. just get up and walk out of there unless you want $100,000, you know, in debt when you leave. And so for so many women, they are not able to advocate for themselves. They mm-hmm. don't know what their rights mm-hmm. are. They aren't prepared when they step foot into those doors. They don't have a husband necessarily that's going with right, them. Right. Um, and it's 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 just, it's inhumane mm-hmm. that we live in the United States of America, mm-hmm. yeah. right? We're living this American dream, but babies are, you know, are dying at alarming yeah. rates and black women yes. are dying at alarming rates. Mm-hmm. And the state of Georgia is like the worst, the worst mm-hmm. yeah. in the country. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I feel Did like you? a part of that is because, um, so I'll go, I go down to Mercer. I've been there twice and they have an initiative program down there and um, it's a rural area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the women are an hour and a half from mm-hmm. their doctor, From closest care. Or they mm-hmm. cannot afford, a, they don't have a car, they can't get to where they need to be. Mm-hmm. It's, um, they have limited resources. And so, um, you also have racist doctors. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. those exist, mm-hmm. and um, it's bad down there. Mm-hmm. And we have some work to do. Mm-hmm. We do. So, we do. A Corey, lot of work. to your point, um, and thank you all for sharing y'all stories. And I'm so grateful that you all one had your own voices and had a great care team. Um, I think a a doula is crucial. A birth worker, someone to be a companion to the mothers. Did you have a doula? Um, 
Uh oh. We'll talk about my doula. Okay. Explain, explain what a doula is. So a doula, for, people who don't uh, for some, and this is you know the words that we use are given to us, um, but doula in the Greek form actually means slave. How? Ooh, shut your yes. Mouth. Yes. However, um, it has been. Um, taken over in a sense in our new day where it's your sister friend it could have been for us our cousin our grandmother at a time but it's really someone who one advocates for you um who provides you support um could be during uh before labor um physically uh mentally and emotionally she cares for the mom and whomever else is in the birth team so the for the fathers um, she, nothing technical. We leave that up to the midwives, the doctors, um, and the nurses. However, she's there to rub your feet, uh, give you a back massage, press those pressure points, um, use some essential oils to calm you. Um, if you're nauseous, give you a little peppermint oil to sniff. Make sure you're hydrated, which is key for mothers um, during labor. Um, and, you know, she's that person you can text. Um, hey, I noticed that my blood pressure is high. I couldn't get in touch with my midwife. What do you think I should do? Instantly go to the hospital or check in with your midwife. So she's there to care for you when you feel like no one else is there to care for you. She's your voice um, when you are in a hospital or in a home birth situation mm -hmm. and you're not feeling comfortable enough to say, hey, I don't really like this position. Mm -hmm. I need to walk around. Why do I feel like this? She's that person who could be your voice um, when you feel like you don't have one. So important. Yes. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I did have a, I had a a midwife mm -hmm. and a doula for the home birth I was okay. planning in two, okay. uh, 2021. I got impatient. Okay. Okay. And did the, um, the brew. Uh -huh. The castor oil. The castor oil brew. Ended up dehydrating myself and that's how oh, I ended goodness. up in the hospital. Okay. Yeah. So okay. that's how I ended up there. And I made that face because, you know, my doula suggested it. I clearly, you know, so, I'm a grown ass know, woman. And that's a, I'm a grown ass woman. And I take responsibility. No, but that's girl, a line. I'm still mad that's, at you. A, that's a thin line. And yeah. to that doula. We're not supposed to give out medical advice. You know. So, uh, That's why it's like, you know, I'm a grown woman. I can't right, really blame her, but girl, right, I'm, right. I'm side eyeing still because yeah. my, my shit went up in flames. Okay. It did not work out for me. <laughs> um, but the fact that this is such a common scenario is mm -hmm. outrageous. Mm -hmm. You have. Uh, I have five children of girl, my own. Have girl, we should have started with this. Know, okay. Right? Wait a minute. Do you each both have one child? I'm one. I have, I have two, one child. Two, one. I'm one. Okay. 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 So I'm one mom. Three dads. Okay. Five children. We all get along. Okay. Um, and um three you hospitals. Got a village, like y'all all get along. We like, do like big community. I, my car was acting up on the way here. I had to call one of the dads and get, jump in his car to come over. Um and we just took all the kids to a water park on Sunday. So I That's love amazing. that for you, Ashley. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. It's a radical act of love. Mm -hmm. Um, something that we in the black community, you know, we all got that uncle who had many kids or that grandpa who kids across the way. But I wanted to create a space where my children felt comfortable and not ashamed mm -hmm. of the fact that there's different dads. Um, so, yeah, I commend you for Thank that. You. Right. Um, the last birth. So my my um, I had a home birth. So two home births, three hospital births, um, no medication. Um, in all five? In all five. Ah, yeah. Now, when I got to the, about that eight centimeter, I was like, can I get an epidural? <laughs> and the, the, <laughs> mid, the midwife was like, actually, you're already about We eight. don't even have time for that. Right. Right. Couldn't even fill up the birth pool. <laughs> Go ahead and squat it out. So wow. um, this last birth was actually, and I don't, I'm not telling women to do this unassisted. It's up to you. But physiologically, I knew where I was. Um, I got to a point where I did call the midwife. I said, I want to go to the hospital. I want an epidural. I had to throw the phone because at that point, I told the dad, you're going to have to catch the baby. So I had the baby at the sink. I was standing at the sink. He caught the baby um, and the baby came out. Midwife came over to do the post care, mm -hmm. you know, birthing the placenta, which is something women don't realize. We also have to birth the placenta. Correct. Right. Um, but yes, uh, so five children um, in my first birth. So how I got into birth work, my dad was my labor coach in 2008. <laughs> wow. And I was literally in the hospital room by myself. The midwives, they were tending to other patients, didn't know that a, a midwife is not there with you the entire time or OB is not there with you. Um, my dad was smoking cigarettes, going to drink coffee. And I was in there by myself. And I said, I just need somebody. To, I had to get a hot towel myself. I had to cool myself off. I had to walk myself around the room. I had to sit myself on a birthing ball. But I did a lot of reading like you. I had my paperwork. I had my birth plan. I knew what I wanted. Um, but I couldn't even afford a doula at the time. So I had to ask my dad. And after that birth, my son was born healthy. Um, 
Um, thanks the Lord. Um, but I said, I want to be there for other women. Like I shouldn't have to yeah. get my own towel. I shouldn't have to try to massage myself. I shouldn't have to cry alone. Um, mm -hmm. and so at that point I said, I want to become a birth worker. And so I wow. want to support moms if they have it or not. Um, so I do office services for moms who can't afford it or for moms who do. Um, and, um, in my second birth, uh, with my daughter afterwards, I had postpartum depression, was afraid to go and say that this is what I have, um, had a failed relationship, um, was fighting with the dead, um, didn't have financial support at the time. And I said, you know what? I got too much education. Um, I have too much smarts for this, um, mm -hmm. and too much strength. Like my grandmother's was like, you can do this. Yes. You can be a single mom. So I stepped out on faith. Um, someone suggested a birth um, a community doula program for me to attend. It was free for, for mothers in the community. Um, we had 120 hours um, with OBGYNs, pediatricians, mm -hmm. lactation consultants, midwives. Um, and from there, so in 2013, I got my doula certification. Um, and the, the the ground has just been lighting up since then. And so. <laughs> wow. Where are your kids at right now? How are you, how are you living your life with five? I mean, seriously. What no, about So I'm actually six months postpartum as we Shut speak. Up. Really? Yes, I'm lactating. <laughs> Girl. So if I start linking on screen. Right. Yes. So um, December, you had a baby in December? I did. Okay. December 28th. Okay. Um, he was born. Well, congratulations. Four. Thank yes. you. His name's Akir, and it means the last. Uh, that's it. I know that's right. So, so, um, let's be clear. My children, they're at home. Um, and you just living like, girl, I I, these but this two is, are slowing me down over here. Right. But this is like you, you know, for you, um, your work is to, your work is with children. Your work is with postpartum moms. Your work is with getting voices out, right? My work is to assist um, women who are birthing um, to make sure that they have that friend where they feel the support. So, so in my opinion, or I guess in, in my world, the concept of a doula is obviously it's not new because mm -hmm. for ages we've, been we've had doulas. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm just, you know, I'm just coming to the party because I just had a baby. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously I heard of a doula before mm -hmm. that, but is this like a concept or something that's becoming more popular? It is. And surprisingly, maybe with the numbers of um, um, the maternal mortality, 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 mortality yeah. rate and infant mortality, um, you know, back then when I did it in 2013, it was not really heard of. People mm -hmm. like, what, what you want to do that for? Why are you trying to help? What? Even when a woman hires a doula, it's almost like, what do you need that so for? So I've had yeah. fathers say, why do we need to pay mm -hmm. for this? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's now evidence. There's mm -hmm. evidence-based data that shows women actually, um, the birthing um, the birthing rates, the well, the, the time that they're in labor is actually shortened. And the mom um, complications um, are lessened in a way. That sounds that like support. less money for a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm but actually, that's why. Yeah, that's why, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know. And, and then to take it back, I mean, this is what women, black women have birthed mm -hmm. this nation. This world. Mm -hmm. This yes. world. This is what we have been doing for centuries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Being a doula for African-American exactly. woman, for African woman, is not anything new no. at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. This is what our people did on the continent and still do mm -hmm. on the continent. Mm -hmm. They may not call it a doula, yeah. but they do have someone there to support. Mm -hmm. yes. Women have been giving birth since the beginning of time. Yes. And yes. it's just now, you know, people are like, oh, we need this. We need this. So with... Um, the history of medicine in America, I want to say 1920s ish, 30 ish, mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot more midwives or sister yes. friends mm -hmm. who were mm -hmm. doing this yes. work in the rural areas. Yes. Of course, in the cities where we were. Um, and because it wasn't prof profitable, profitable yeah. mm -hmm. for the man or the medical structure, they said you have to be licensed now, right? Mm -hmm. So you have more nursing, you have more mm -hmm. um, midwives who are actually being persecuted kind of like a new age witch hunt mm -hmm. um but it was it was us who were providing that care and so it's funny how we revert back as a nation to the mm -hmm. things that actually worked yes. the crazy thing is though this is the original way mm -hmm. of birthing right mm -hmm. westernized medicine and this procedural mm -hmm. sterile birthing line. yeah it's yeah. like a, an assembly line okay you do mm -hmm. this now you do that okay mm -hmm. you're next up we're making our rounds mm -hmm. we're checking you off the mm -hmm. list okay you did 
birth, first of all, is like the closest thing to death. It That's is. first of all. You're at the veil, yeah. Second of all, it's one of the, especially for a first time mother, one of the most scariest because you don't oh, watch all these movies. You, 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 I mean, the anxiety. <laughs> you're just right. you're terrified. So to right. go through this in an environment where it's like somebody's coming in and they're clearly just working a job mm-hmm. versus a doula who's in this because she cares. A midwife is yeah. in this because she cares about this process. It's just a totally different yeah, thing. But is. we've gotten to the place now where it's frowned upon. If you want to have a home birth, people think you're crazy. Why would you yeah. want to risk it? And they don't realize the risk of going to the hospital. hospital. Yeah. Right. I get that all the time, actually, you know, as a pediatrician. So a lot of times, well, not all the time, but we will see the baby in the hospital if there are complications. Okay. Um, and, and it happens, you know. And I, I, I think of a mom recently um, that came in and she was feeling guilty that she decided to do a home birth. I said, why? Yeah. Why? You made the decision and it's still a good decision. Yes, your baby is here, but... We're going to be all right. Yeah. And your yeah. baby's going to be just fine. But you made the decision that was best for you exactly. and your family yeah. at that time. And that's what we want you to do. However, if there are complications, mm-hmm. bring the baby right on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we yeah. will take care of the, the child. So don't feel guilty in your yeah. choice. So I want to ask you, Dr. Mike, because mm-hmm. recently there was a um, popular um like news story where a family mm-hmm. had a home birth, mm-hmm. ended up taking the baby to the doctor. Baby mm-hmm. had jaundice. I think mm-hmm. they wanted to recommend a treatment. The mom didn't want it. And then CPS showed up at the house to take mm-hmm. the baby. Mm-hmm. How common is that? And what can we do to protect ourselves? Because that's scary as hell. And yes, I can see that scaring a mom away from having a home birth. Oh, absolutely. It's a stereotype. First of all, they probably just looked at the situation and mm-hmm. assumed, made a whole bunch of assumptions. And that provider didn't take the time to really hear that mother. Why don't you, you know, want this treatment? This is what, you know, we recommend. This is best practices. Help me understand understand what what your barrier is to accepting Mm -hmm. the treatment and then let's work together on figuring out a better way to do it because there's multiple ways to skin a cat in medicine usually Mm -hmm. I mean the baby may not have needed to come into the hospital the baby might have done okay with the billy blanket at home to get to cure the um, or to take care of the hyperbilirubinemia that's what the medical diagnosis is but there's multiple ways to to really get around the issue or the yeah. challenge. And all it was was that that worker, unfortunately, our workers decided, oh, I'm going to label this mother or this mm-hmm. family as, you know, they're not wanting care. They're resistant to care. They're resistant to what the medical team is saying. Oh, let's call CPS. Mm-hmm. And whenever, historically in our community, when we hear those three letters, it's always, a, oh, they're trying to take my baby away from me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Historically, that's been the case. Yeah. that I think that that keeps, culturally, that keeps us also away from expressing our mental state. Yes. Right? Yes. I was just going to say Or that. saying, oh, I think my blood pressure is high. Right. Um, for me, it, I was afraid to call and say, hey, I'm having some issues with nursing. Mm-hmm. My you know, sometimes when you're breastfeeding, that's another stigma in our community at times. I need some help, yeah. mm-hmm. you know. Um, but you're scared to speak up. You're scared yeah, of what the consequences up. are mm-hmm. going to be. During this last pregnancy, um, because I had a C-section the first time, they wanted to schedule me for a C-section at 39 mm-hmm. weeks. So I'm like, well, if y'all schedule me at 39 weeks, right. you're not even giving my body a, a chance. chance. Right. Right. So I'm like, no, you know, if that's what I end up doing, fine. But I at least want to see, can my body even go into labor naturally? Yeah. Um, and so the doctor literally said out of her mouth, that's fine. But I just want to let you know that you might end up giving birth in a hostile environment for going against, you know, the doctors. And I was just like, Really? Hostile what? environment. Hostile, I just want to warn you. You yeah. know, she's real nice about it. I just want to warn you. You know, if you don't go with this recommendation, it's fine. Right. But you might end up giving birth in a hostel. And I'm like, well, it was pretty hostile the first time. So I don't, you know, think it's going to be <laughs> it too was ready. But the, the fact that that's a thing, it is. though, yeah. it is. is like if I don't do with my body, excuse me, what you want me to do with my body. Exactly. I'm going, it's a problem. Like it's a problem. Yeah, I'm breaking the law or something. So it's that I think is what black women um, immediately think about. When they say, I don't want to go to the hospital. Right. Or, you know, these are the stories that that we are considering. In that case, though, are do we have any rights truly? 
You do. You absolutely do. I mean, just you, you kid, but it's true. You have rights when you go yeah. into that hospital yes. yeah. and you have the right to let them know what your plan or your birthing plan or what you would like for it to your be, intention. Mm-hmm. Um, your intention. Now, of course, things happen. Birthing is unpredictable sometimes. Yes. And so it may not always go as planned. And so you do have to be a bit flexible, right. um, but you still do have rights. You have the power. I mean, it's your body yes. yes and it's your it's your insurance that part <laughs> and i uh i express to the to, to the birthing folks when we're there in the hospital this is your birth plan yes you've given it to the nurses and the doctors we do have to be flexible because things do arise let's hear it out let's ask what are all of my options Correct. instead of being presented well this is what you have to do right at 39 weeks let's sign you up for a cesarean section well wait how about we wait to about 40 weeks? Okay, well, we might have to go to 41, but these are your options. So informing, like educating um, yes. ourselves, right? I mm-hmm. know we can read all the books, but also having a second, you know, opinion. Sec- a second opinion, yeah. mm-hmm. a helping ear mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, really helps in those environments mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What would you all say um, in terms of prevention? If there is something, anything mm-hmm. that we could possibly offer as a solution for maybe an expecting mother out there. Because I don't want to scare y'all because yeah. that baby got to come out. Okay. So I don't want to <laughs> scare you. The baby is coming. But yeah. what is there anything that can be done as far as prevention um, for some of these complications or issues? Well, I always... Um... When I'm telling my story, because some women, they they look at me like, you know, they I can tell they're afraid. Mm-hmm. I tell my story and I advocate not to take the joy away from giving birth or childbirth. It's just to simply inform them. Mm-hmm. And so to prevent some of the complications, I feel like you need to be in tune with your body. Mm-hmm. Listen mm-hmm. to your body and also mm-hmm. listen to your providers. Yes, you can have a birth plan and mm-hmm. you can... Um, you have rights and you can say what you want to happen and what you don't want to happen. But don't um, you guys need to work together as a team. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's why I'm still here. And that's why I went mm-hmm. on to have another birth, mm-hmm. um, because I listened to my doctors and they listened to me. Um, but that's a big thing. Listen to your body. Yeah, and, and I would agree with that. And, you know, if you're considering having children at some point in life, it's, it's really important to think about what that process is going to look like years ahead of time. Yes. Right. So I mentioned that I was 80 pounds heavier than I am now. If there was one thing that I wish that I would have changed, it would have been to lose weight. Wow. My IVF procedure would have been better. My pregnancy would have been better. And I knew all those things, but I still didn't do it. My blood pressure might have been better controlled. I mean, who knows? So that meant that I had to really take ownership of my body and like, okay, Maya, you are 230 pounds at five feet, four and a half inches. That's too heavy for you. Let's lose some weight. And so had I done that, maybe things would have been different. Now, I'd always been on blood pressure medicine. I'd had blood pressure, uh, high blood pressure for years prior to me getting mar- uh, pregnant. Um, but again, an IVF pregnancy does increase your risk of preeclampsia in the first place and, so, and hypertension problems during the pregnancy. Um, but had I changed my diet a little bit, you know, um, we do recommend sometimes the Mediterranean style mm-hmm. of eating um, is better. What when is you're... the Mediterranean style? So it's basically lean lean meat. Um, you want to do lots of nuts. You're staying away from a lot of the processed foods. So you really want to focus on the protein component. You don't want to e- ever eliminate any food group completely from your diet. Your body needs all of those food groups. But um, it's important to kind of focus on the, the pro- unprocessed foods or the less processed foods. Um, lean meats, beans, nuts, whole grains, those kinds of foods um, are helpful when you're trying to conceive. Mm -hmm. Um, And certainly when you're pregnant, you know, I know at least my, my, my people say, well, you know, you eating for two. So you got to eat <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. From the root into the tuna. Listen, <laughs> I, listen, don't do like me. I went through uh, Chick-fil-A every day. See, that was part of my blood pressure yeah, that issue. Was that, yeah. that was my blood pressure. So I should not have done that. I knew better. 
But every time I pass by that that it was store, cold. I was like, "Fries, that was come on, yeah. come on, eat come on eat eat in. Chicken. But just <laughs> things like that, just practically that you can do to prevent some of these complications from yeah. happening, is so important. Super it important. makes your journey going forward that much easier. And I also want to touch on you said pre conception. Think about it before you get pregnant. Before. And so um, I was at Mercer last month and Dr. Uh, Baker, she's a OBGYN down mm-hmm. there. She is fabulous. Okay. Mm. Um, she was saying that we have to start going to preconception appointments, mm-hmm. like plan. Mm-hmm. Now I didn't plan any of my children. I was just um, out here. Surprise. Girl, right. <laughs> right. I was out here too. But it's okay. had a chance to plan that. <laughs> but if you, if you are intentional about, you know, when you want to have children and you, you know, you've gotten married or even if you, you know, haven't got married, but if you know, you want to have kids, have a preconception appointment. I feel like mm-hmm. the doctors can mm-hmm. inform you about your Where risk. You, you can talk about your family history Mm -hmm. because like you said about the fibroids a lot of women don't know that something runs in their family until Mm -hmm. they're faced with it Mm -hmm. yeah and if you don't wait until you're pregnant to start discovering all of the things um, that you might be uh, predisposed to i do want to get into ivf though Mm -hmm. because as you mentioned it's going on out here it is but black women don't want to talk about it and you know i really don't understand why i mean and Mm -hmm. i do let me just say this. I do because I really do think that it's because of the reproductive trauma that our, we have sustained as African-American mm-hmm. women in this country for centuries. If you were an African-American woman slave who could produce a child, then you were more valuable to that mm-hmm. slave owner. Let's just be honest. You could produce more labor. And so that then meant that you attached your worth as a woman to your ability to conceive. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so then come on down the line, 2000s, and you can't conceive. Mm-hmm. Or you don't know that you can conceive until you start trying and you're having challenges to conceive. It really does affect your self-worth mm-hmm. as a woman. This is what we were created to do. And so I know I have my grandmother birthed nine children. I have five aunts and I don't recall any conversations being had about anybody having any difficulty having children. Not that it didn't happen, but it wasn't talked about. Right, right. So then when it came time for me and here I am deciding to pursue medicine. Hello, residency. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these years of training, I got married later in life. And we decided to expand our family. And I, they was like, Err. no, ma'am, mm. you're going to have some problems. You got PCOS. You've danced around with diabetes. Mm. You got chronic hypertension. Mm. This is going to be an uphill battle for you. My saving grace, prevention. My OB said to me when I was 34, Maya, if you have any op- want, to, want to start a family at all, you're going to need to look into freezing your eggs. Mm. Mm. But you had someone to tell you that. Was it a eggs. white woman? Nope. Okay. Mm. Nope. It was a black woman. And I chose her again on purpose. But she had that very real conversation with me. Had she not mentioned that to me, I probably wouldn't have my daughter now. Mm -hmm. And so I went through the process. Then I was single as a dollar bill (laughs) and I got six embryo, six eggs. Now, that's not usual for an IVF, you know, procedure when you're harvesting eggs. Usually most women can get like 15, 20, you know, uh-huh. large amounts of eggs. But because I have PCOS, sometimes you can get more, but they're, those follicles are not mature eggs. Mm. There's no mature eggs in them. So I only had six. So I took my little six, put them on, on ice, and I was like, all right, let me go on about my merry little way. Found my or my husband found me, mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> we got married. And I said to the reproductive endocrinologist that we want to try again, and um, she said, "Okay, let's go through this process again." And she sat there. My husband had to have a procedure after it was over and unsuccessful. Mm. She sat there and looked at both of us and said, "You will never have your own biological oh, child." Goodness. What would possess someone to say that out of their out of their face to anyone? Word you know, is we hardly ever say the word never yeah. in medicine. Mm-hmm. And and I just looked at her and was like, You said what now? 
I mean, and everything else she said out of her mouth after that was just a stream of tears down my face. I didn't hear anything mm. she said. I know she said something about an embryo adoption. I know she said something about an egg adoption or a sperm adoption, neither of which I had even thought of, considered nothing. What and so, does that even mean? Right? So you mm. can actually adopt an embryo. Wow. So there are um, some couples who've gone through the IVF procedure and they've created embryos that they're not going to use. Mm. You can actually decide to give them for adoption. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. I know you were. We, I'm going to let you keep going, but <laughs> wait a minute. How does this? Yes. So, and then I, I'm artificially inseminated with yes. the, that yeah, embryo. The, the embryo is transferred into your uterus. Wow, I did not know that was a thing. Yes, so they actually kind of, you know, mimic what the the hormonal thing, what it would be like to be pregnant and and implant that embryo right into your uterus and you're pregnant. Interesting. Or you could opt to, you know, um, purchase an an egg. There are egg donors, um, people that donate to to banks. Now, I will say there's not a lot of African-American eggs available. Um, (laughs) There are not a lot of African-American sperm that are available, but you can choose to choose your egg, choose your sperm fertilize the two and now you have your own embryo but in your case you were able to go back to those six i was i was able to go back to the six and then we tried again we actually switched providers i know you did um we we went with yes we went with somebody who was committed to helping us grow our family and so he said okay let's do this again i eked out three I mean, by the hair of my chin, chin, chin. Okay. And so I put the two together. So I had nine total. Out of those nine, eight fertilized. And they have to go through a period of growth. So they allow them to grow in the lab. Once they get to a certain stage in growth, they will send pieces of it to a testing. We decided to do the genetic testing uh, because of my age and, you know, all of the medical diseases I had at that time. And so by the time all is said and done, I had two genetically normal embryos that were just as much my genetic material and my husband. I love yes. it. Beautiful. And one of them is my three-year-old daughter. Yes. 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 I would be sending pictures of my baby to that doctor's office every Listen, year. Chloe, if I started to be petty <laughs> like that, I did. It crossed my mind. I did. And I was like, no, I'm not going to even do it. I'm going to just be out here and Bless start the doctor's wound yeah. to yeah. let people know that you have some solutions. Yes. Don't let anybody tell you if this is what you want to do, have a baby. Don't let them tell you yeah. you can yeah. because there are options. Wow. There are options. There is. I have three friends who uh, in their careers, we went to Spelman, we graduated, everyone. You went to Spelman too? Yes. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> in a moment. But they they did similar journeys. Yes. Um, two out of three so far. Two just had their babies, That's and one um, she's still working on it. Yeah. But, um, it's something that I didn't learn about until they shared it as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm glad we that the news is it. spreading mm-hmm. to yes. them, and it's it's an opportunity for us. Yeah. I've heard that white women like gift like eggs yes. freezing yes. to their yes. daughters. They do. So yeah. there are Excuse grandmothers me? who gift it Whoa. to their 21-year-old granddaughters so that they can do their egg harvesting and, and go, go out about and their life. around and what? live their life. Yep, and come on back. We are late to the party on every important yeah. conversation in our community. Mm-hmm. Not only are we late to the party, when we find out what's going on at the party, we're like, oh, why would we want to do that? You right. know, why would we want to have IVF? Yeah. It just ain't in it for you. God it's, just it's, exactly. That's what we, that's yeah. our, our exactly. default. Or is when if God wanted yeah. it to happen. It would happen. It exactly. would happen. Or we're made, um, we're guilt trip because of decisions we might have made when we were younger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. some, you know, some people say, well, I can't have this baby right now. I'm going to have an abortion. Mm-hmm. And then they say, well, you shouldn't have had that abortion. And you shouldn't went. We had to send you down I south. I actually wanted to talk about abortions, yeah. but not in the sense, obviously not in the sense of right or wrong, because baby, that is mm-hmm. your business. But the effects of abortion. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if anybody here is qualified to mention these effects. If if not, mm-hmm. we can move on. But I want, I don't, I don't feel like we ever talk about what actually happens to your body as a result of an abortion? Mm, the it? physical. I can't speak. I've never experienced it. I've had um, people around me who have. And, you know, what I can speak to, not just the physical, you know, I guess what they describe to me is just an emptiness. Mm-hmm. 
you know, but really more so it's the psychological and emotional pain mm -hmm. that they go through. Because yeah, you have to carry that on your own. I'm going to be honest. I've had um, three abortions, just so y'all know. <laughs> um, and one in, in college, mm -hmm. went to the, I didn't know I was pregnant. What is going on? I just had it started having sex in college. <laughs> went to the, um, to the clinic and they said, um, you're pregnant. I didn't know. <laughs> but at the time, um, the actual doctor who um, performed the procedure was a Morehouse man. Mm -hmm. um, and I was awake for the procedure. Um, it was horrible. He actually said that my cervix tore. I'm bit. sorry, wait a minute. I, I don't awake. know. I'm, I don't know much about this procedure, but you're so, not supposed to be awake, right? No, you no. can. There's different methods, so you can be awake Ooh. and they numb you. You can be put to sleep, or you can do the pill. Okay. Yeah. For mm -hmm. this one, I said I want to be awake because at the time I was vegan. I was aware of my body. I was physically active. I want to know what's going on. At least I can be awake because I'm not gonna have this baby, right? It was traumatizing so mm. to say the least and he also said oh i tore your cervix um not oh my bad like, right. oh but it's <laughs> that the way. that you're again culturally you know we're told you know you shouldn't be having this procedure um and from there i think the my when my fi cycle finally came back around it was the worst pain i had ever mm. felt in my entire life um because the lining, you know, mm -hmm. it's you're you're being sucked out. Mm -hmm. Um, not to say that, you know, I support women who have any type of experience in their reproductive health. You know, I've support I went with friends who have to have the procedure as well. Um, but I can say that was the only complication I've ever had with an abortion. After that I never did that <laughs> way again. Yeah. I was put to sleep uh for the other ones. Um, but some women, um, I don't know exactly the extent of the physical harm that could be done to your womb, but I mean, that experience did um, stick with me. Yeah, yeah. I, I mm -hmm. can. I mean, I cannot imagine being awake for any type of procedure. That is yeah. that is next level right there. Um, but I I can just imagine uh, what you put yourself through mm -hmm. after having to make such mm -hmm. tough decisions. And I really just want to um, be able to use this platform to bring a different perspective to mm -hmm. all of the conversations mm -hmm. because it seems like they're mm -hmm. just it's like well, it's exactly. repeat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's you know, every mm -hmm. conversation is just on repeat and and it's a lot of judgment mm -hmm. and not very much solution. Mm -hmm. And so my thing is these things are happening. Mm -hmm. Right? They're yeah. happening. What can we do to either prevent them, help you manage it, like work through it, something. What mm -hmm. is the solution in all of this? So um I really just appreciate the work that you all are doing. Like the fact that you have dedicated yeah. your life to this mission um i just want to give y'all y'all flowers i should have had some flowers Aww. here y'all we could have made this a thing um but seriously to to have gone through you know mm -hmm. your own experiences and to not just say it stops here right. like i've done totally. it but now i want to help somebody else do it right. that mm -hmm. is big right you know dr right. maya you ain't got to be yeah. doing it you are dr maya right, <laughs> right. Dr. Maya said it, it's more than just medicine oh, right it's more than just medicine yeah. it's more than just medicine because there are women out there needlessly suffering and they don't have to they be don't have yeah. to crying themselves to sleep at night because yes. they think that their journey to motherhood has been shut down and it's over and it's not yeah. wow. it's not i'm 27 Mm. And you are the first person, like black woman, that I've known to have IVF wow. because really? it's not talked about. Mm -mm. Wow! And she's not the first one you know. She's just the first one you heard talk about it because exactly. it's not. It's not talked it's not about. Talked about. It's, and right I don't about know that. if there's yeah. a well. I think you explained it perfectly. There is almost like a sense of shame. It of, is. I couldn't. This is. And you know, I said it, and now that I'm talking through it. I definitely experienced some shame through having to have a C-section. Mm -hmm. Probably that similar yeah. thing of mm -hmm. I, yeah. why can't my body do exactly. what it's naturally supposed to do? So I can definitely understand. Yeah. I, de I felt like my body had betrayed me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm like, this is what I was created to do. I can't do it. So there was definitely a feeling of shame, loneliness, isolation. I mean, I'm going to my IVF clinics with a glasses on and a hoodie, mm -hmm. hoping I don't see nobody that I know. I actually did one day, and I was like, hey. And then just kept it moving. We, we we to, I mean, you know, I'm just like, oh, hey, this girl. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's that whole thing. And I thought it, I was by myself in this. And then come to find out, you know, like, love to say, come to find out. <laughs> My sister-in-law had gone through IVF. Right. I had, had no, no idea. idea. She didn't sell it. 
she didn't say it to anybody, but that's just like it, it's more common mm-hmm. than you think it mm-hmm. is. We just don't talk about Same it. Same with uh, postpartum anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. So I thought mm-hmm. I was going crazy. And I was very afraid. Like, my mm. family was, too. I had yeah. never had any type of mental health issues before, but I couldn't sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really traumatized by my um, ICU stay. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't anything that the nurses did. It was just when they put me over there, I seen... Um, I seen people on their deathbed. Yeah. And so I thought I was next. Yeah. And... um. It was it was very traumatizing to me, but you know, in my community, if you say you know you may need help, oh, you crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We don't go sit on nobody couch. Mm-hmm. But I promise you, I'm not ashamed to say I take my anxiety medicine still to this day, mm-hmm. and I see a therapist because yes. I know mm-hmm. that I need help. And I try to explain this to people like if you have a headache, mm-hmm. you take Tylenol for the headache, right? right? right. You go see about the headache. So it's the same mm-hmm. thing. You have to. Mm-hmm. I would. If I had one hope for for our community, it was it would be to go see about your mental health mm-hmm. 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 and don't I, be ashamed. I, I just oh sorry, go ahead. Corey. No, I, I, I've just been saying to myself and to anybody who would listen that they need to send you home with a lactation consultant, mm-hmm. yes, mm-hmm. and a damn therapist, indeed. Mm-hmm. Because what what am I supposed to do with this baby? You just right. Yeah. I know it's mine, but you just gonna leave me right. here right. with this baby? Right. They do not That's come with an instruction. It doesn't come with instructions. Doesn't come with a support line, mm-hmm. a hotline, mm-hmm. a. Mm-hmm. An assistant, yeah. a cook, mm-hmm. anything. So that's why I I published a postpartum workbook and journal, mm. and it's entitled "Everything Is Going to Be Okay." Oh. Um, and I titled it because one of the ICU nurses said that to me, and um, I really believed her. Mm-hmm. She made me believe that, and mm-hmm. it everything did turn out to be okay. It just mm-hmm. it wasn't okay at the time, but it mm-hmm. did end up you being okay. okay. Yeah. And so now, um. I'm in the works of trying to get my workbook to be covered by insurances because you're right. Once you go home, that's, you know, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. They give you a folder with like, you know, resources to WIC or whatever else, but we need real Mm -hmm. resources and real Mm -hmm. help. And as pediatricians, we do screen the moms when they bring their babies in for their newborn exam, you know, to make sure the mother is okay. Yeah, but you're scared Um, to circle yes on any of these things. Exactly. Exactly. So what do you do? So if you truly feel like, okay, I really, something is probably mm-hmm. really going on, but. It really, at least for me, because I, I had the same, I didn't know it was PTSD. First of all, let me just say that. I didn't know it was PTSD because my mind was so focused on, I got to get to this NICU and take care of my baby. Mm. It's the pandemic. Can't nobody take care of her. I can't be there. So let me do what I need to do. So I pushed all of my feelings to the side. Mm. It wasn't until on the other side of that experience that I realized this was some PTSD. Mm -hmm. There was some anxiety in here. There was some depression in this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And it took my family to see the change and the difference in me to really just encourage me. Mm -hmm. Um, I also knew something was not quite right as well. And so I reached out on my own. But I, I think it's that whole thing of, you know, we have to be our sister's keeper sometimes mm-hmm. because a lot of times we're not going to say anything about right, it. Right. But if you notice your friend is going through, girl, yes. come on, yeah. let's just sit down. Let's yes. just be real and talk about this. Yep. So yes. that helped me talking to my friends. Um, what I found in birthing is, you know, the pregnancy process, it could either be traumatizing or healing. And mm-hmm. and at the same time, they can, that can be the same. Um, but hearing Fran's stories about IVF, Knowing that my friend goes to see a therapist, this last pregnancy that I had, I decided to go in. I, I had high blood pressure. I said, oh, something is not, mm-hmm. something's wrong. My heart is beating too fast. Mm-hmm. Went in. They did an ultrasound. The baby was okay. They gave me some calcium magnesium. They said, well, have you really been eating? Oh, I was stressed. School was starting back for the other children. My father had moved in with mm-hmm. me. I hadn't been with my father since I was like 16. Um, and it triggered some trauma. Mm-hmm. decided to go see a therapist found out I had PTSD as well so I too take anxiety meds mm-hmm. daily mm-hmm. Um, and go see my therapist every other week but mm-hmm. it wasn't until we had these real conversations like yes. we're having mm-hmm. where I said you know what I'm not the only one who feels this way yes. mm-hmm. not I'm at not all. the only one let me 
find the resources. Let me go back through those folders that we get when we go to the doctor mm-hmm. and say, yes. hey, if you're ever feeling like this, here's a hotline number. Mm-hmm. Call it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're not going to take your baby. CPS ain't no, going to come. They will not take you your baby. You might have to check in somewhere once or twice if it's to the extreme, but yes. it's for your health. It's for your health. It's yes. for your health. It really yeah. is. And I think it's important to note that postpartum can be depression yes. as well as anxiety. anxiety. Mm-hmm. We often leave off that anxiety part. Anxiety part, part. Yes. yeah. But when you get home with that baby, Whew. and you got to make sure that baby breathing every moment of the day, right? Whew. the anxiety will overcome you yes. if you don't recognize it, if mm-hmm. you don't have support. Like when I think about Single mothers or it's teen no mothers. Yeah, yeah. And I was mm-hmm. a grown, a whole ass, grown <laughs> ass, 35-year-old woman and right. still didn't know what I was doing. I we just gotta do better. And I know yeah, that this podcast yeah. episode is not gonna get policy changed. <laughs> like you know, but yeah, something has to be it's done. It's a step yes. in the right direction. Yes. Yes. At least getting the awareness out there yes. and, and helping people to understand that A, you have a voice. B, you have to advocate for yourself, mm-hmm. even yes. if nobody else will. And C, you have options. You absolutely have options. So when I'm talking mm-hmm. to my moms sometimes that are struggling, um, I use an analogy and some people look at me like, what? You're crazy. But it's like having a baby is like having a pet. And don't... don't Listen, listen, no, hear me out. Is. You know when you were younger and you asked your parents for a pet and you really, really wanted it, and then when you got it, you was like, ooh, this is a lot of responsibility. Yeah. I got to feed this dog. I got to mm-hmm. walk this dog. Mm-hmm. I got to train this dog. With a dog, you can rehome. Or, you know, you guys can pass it on to somebody else. But with a child, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. You, you're stuck. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, sometimes we have... Um, hiccups where we we're surprised with pregnancy but going back to what we were saying earlier it's really good that you plan for it yeah and make mm-hmm. sure that that's what you really want as much as you can yeah. right yes. you know because things do happen You're right but my point was to say you know making sure your physical body is mm-hmm. in the best shape that it can be as well as your mental yes. health yeah. um before you proceed to to doing something like this it's a big undertaking to yes. be a mother it and really it does is. not stop, okay? Mm-hmm. No. Because the kid is still at my house. I feel like, <laughs> dang, this little boy is still, baby, he is still here. This is crazy. So, listen, I had to end on a joke, okay? Because this was heavy, yes. all right? Yes. Let yes. us know in the comments what you have learned. Um, And please share this episode with somebody, okay? Yes. Even if yes. you don't know someone who needs it, just share it. Because someone you send it to is going to to need the solutions yes. that we shared um, on this conversation. I will make sure that I link all of the ladies' info down below so that you can stay connected with them. If you need a doula, if you need an advocate, if mm-hmm. you need a doctor, baby, we got you covered. <laughs> hey, okay? <yeah. laughs> Let us know um, if you enjoyed this conversation. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes, and we will see you next week. If you enjoyed that episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming content and take it a step further and go ahead and join our private community over on Patreon because it comes with some pretty bomb perks, including early and discounted access to our upcoming events, behind the scene exclusives with some of your favorite guests, the opportunity to call in on an upcoming show, the chance to vote on topics and guests for brand new shows, and I'm even giving you unlimited access to my vault of business classes where I'm teaching you everything from Airbnb to developing digital products and everything in between. And you can get access to our Patreon for as little as $5 a month, okay? Get in where you fit in, and I'll see you on the inside. Peace.